How do you mitigate your risk? Montel's forecasting services cover risks from hours ahead to years ahead. We welcome you to hedge your market exposure with our diverse forecasting portfolio. Contact us at sales at montelnews.com for more info and a free trial. Hello listeners and welcome to the Montel Weekly Podcast, bringing you energy matters in an informal setting. Today's pod is a bit of a mixed bag. We will look back in time before discussing current market developments and then move on to a glimpse into the future. Today's guest is a pioneer of European wholesale energy markets. He played a key role in the integration of of the continent's electricity markets, driving on market coupling and cross-border trading. He was at the helm of Amsterdam-based APX, seeing the company through a series of acquisitions in the UK and the Benelux region. And he still has very ambitious plans to help with the decarbonisation of Europe. So joining me, Richard Sverson today, is Bert Den Auden. A warm welcome to you, Bert. Thank you for having me, Richard. I know you're a consultant now at Berenschot, but uh, I think before we talk about your current role and and what you're up to at the moment, I I hope you don't mind me dwelling a little bit on the past. Please do, please do. How, in your view, have sort of markets developed over the past 10, 15 years? I'm talking about wholesale electricity and gas markets in particular. I have, of course, like you mentioned, the experience by curating those markets or being helpful in curating them in the past. Interesting is that is now the month of November. Next Monday, on the 9th of November, it is 20 years since the CWE market coupling started. And its predecessor started in 2006 or 14 years ago on the 25th of November. So the November is an important month (laughs) when it comes to the history of the European electricity market integration. And I can say that uh, that has gone very well indeed. I think more countries have joined that market. Of course, we have a market coupling in CWE, which has been involved, and the ever tighter coupling of all the regions and more and more countries coming to the system. So I think now the whole majority is now a single market, albeit it is a single part-time, which is then it has one price. And it has for other moments, it has different prices, but it gets as close as it can be. And it's really a big success uh, story. And I think it deserves more attention, this achievement, which so many people have worked very hard on from the TSOs and from the exchanges and still do to this day. And I found out when I was in touch with the EPEX uh, spot lately, that this market is now operated online from uh, people's homes. The employees of the exchange in this COVID-19 time are operating it all remotely at that desk at home. This is incredible. A European coupling market spanning from Finland to Iberia and Italy and, and, and everything is operated on a decentralized manner from people's homes when it is needed. It's a remarkable achievement. You wouldn't have thought that would have been possible 14, 15 years ago then, Bert, that uh, that would have been our direction of travel or the end point. I thought that the market coupling was possible and, and I believed in it and I realized big parts of it. To see it realized now in, in such a manner with this achievement of the ICT, it is really quite something. But coming back to the market coupling, it deserves more attention. I would say that November could be rechristened as the market (laughs) coupling month Mm. of Europe to herald all the achievements and see the new things coming. I learned that, of course, the CW market coupling, flow-based market coupling has been upgraded lately. So that's another step forward. It's no coincidence that we choose November to speak to you, Bert. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> it was all part of the plan. You it's see. all part of the plan. Okay. But for you personally, but what are you most proud of spanning back these last sort of 15, 20 years? I really would mention two things, uh, three things. First of all, when I was um, running APX Index, it was really in the market coupling. The CW, first the trilateral and later the CW in the flow-based market coupling. Those were the the heydays of the plan, the big plan to turn once a monopoly-run commodity 
into a real market-based thing with all the benefits. Because I thought early around the turn of the century in 2001 and 2002, it were national markets, but they did not have the full benefits of the liberalization. It was only after we connected them through the market coupling that you get to the full benefits of the whole thing. So the full potential of the liberalization in electricity was only realized um, after the market coupling, I think. Second thing is, I think, the TTF market, uh, the big guys market. TTF by now, I did a lot of things to create it, an important hub in gas trading. After I left, it grew further and further and further until now it's become the main market in Europe and one of the key indicators worldwide of natural gas trading. I think that that has been an incredible adventure too, leading index for all of the gas prices in Europe. But the third came afterwards at Beresot Consultancy that we realized that gas and electricity are both needed or renewable gas and renewable electricity. Uh, we did that when we did um, scenarios. First, we did electrons and molecules to uh, see how both can be added to each other to get a sound and cheap path to the energy transition. And lately, we did also a carbon neutral scenarios for the Netherlands in 2050. So three achievements um, all connected to together. Knowing what you know now, is there anything you would have done differently? Ah, I hadn't thought of that question before, which means it doesn't come naturally to, <laughs> to me that I should have done things differently. That's, that's fair enough, Bert. If you, you know, you're I very happy with all your decisions. I cannot think of anything, uh, really. <laughs> <laughs> so you're very happy with the way things have done and all the decisions you took. That's, absolutely, yeah, no, that's, absolutely. Uh, I was very happy, uh, I think, for the, market, uh, for the market and for many people in the market, there was a lot of fulfillment and a lot of promises that were kept. I mean, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about decarbonization and some of the scenarios that you outlined earlier. But I'd like to, to first of all talk about the landscape in Europe. There have been some changes within the exchange. There's been some consolidation, some growth. I remember interviewing you 15 years ago, Bert, and you were talk, we were talking about competition versus cooperation. What do you think is the role of exchanges at the moment? You know, do you think they, they're suited to, to compete or should they cooperate more? Or is there a combination of the two? Well, it's been quite extraordinary, the achievement, that they are able to do both at the same time. It was needed for the market coupling, absolutely. And in my time, there was also some competition of sorts. And now they compete more. At the same time, they cooperate for the sake of this market integration. I think uh, I was explaining to the people in other parts of the world, and I couldn't understand it. And I said, well, this is Europe. This is how we work. We compete for the sake of the optimization and we work together for the sake of the optimization because there are two types of optimization the optimization of the market and the optimization of the system and that's what market coupling does Sweet. but is, is there a danger for example in the spot markets that you might split liquidity that's already quite sort of precarious in some areas by forcing too much competition here I don't think that there is a threat caused by the competition between exchanges because it's all happening within this virtual hub system with this all this so while there is competition between exchanges the liquidity is bundled at the same time that is how the system is working and we get the first experience with that in the uk and then it was transferred to other countries so really we have the best of both worlds <laughs> or you can have your cake and eat it perfect too. exactly what more do you want <laughs> if we're talking as well there's been a lot of discussion in recent months and, and years about uh, changing the bidding zones within europe what's your view here but should you split large zones or you know is that i know it's very politically very difficult politically it's very difficult but like you very often see after a while the the techno economical reality sets in it's been a very difficult discussion in the nordic before they split sweden into different price zones i think it's a very difficult discussion here in central europe it was happening in my time already I think it has advantages to 
create some splitting of zones at the same time maintaining a big enough price areas. I think it would be advantageous to look into that. I think if you don't do it, then the stress will continue to build up. And uh, the stress, it, it, what I mean, keeping the, the large bidding zones together and trying to hold it together uh, by redispatch and all the costs with that, with all the regional imbalances that are there. And that will continue. I think the, the energy transition will put more and more strain to the mm. system. Mm. Are you a fan of nodal pricing instead of bidding zones? I'm not a fan of anything. <laughs> mm-hmm. Nodal pricing is known around the world. It's a fair system. It's a mandatory system. Everything has to go through the pool. In Europe, we have done, we've gone a different road, which is in some aspect more liberal than the, for instance, the nodal system, which is happening in the United States. In a way, the pool system, uh, the nodal pool system, but any pool system is more centralistic. And the rules of the pool determine a lot about the pricing. The advantages of having a zonal system, any zonal system, also with more pricing zones, but it stays the same. And the, and the exchanges can handle it, mm. and the TSOs is that you have a system which is not governed by pricing rules of the exchange, but which is counterbalanced and challenged by the bilateral market. It is perhaps strange to hear me say a thing like that. Uh, I was also, (laughs) but when I brokered the, uh, the market coupling deal, that was really done between me as the chairman of Europex, of the exchanges, and EFAT, the Federation of Traders. And I promised them one thing. Don't, I will not go for a monetary market. I will go for a market coupling, which takes part of the cross-border trade. But at the same time, there will be the bilateral trade. And that was a deal which got me and the TSOs into the Florence Forum. And there we got in the Florence Forum 2004. We got a majority. And we got an understanding. And I want to keep that deal. I think it's good. Was there any resistance to that deal then within the Florence Forum? At that time, the resistance was coming from, yeah, large industries. At that time, Germany. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it was difficult. But we had an understanding with the French and the Belgians. So then we created the, the trilateral market coupling in 2006, 25th of November. I, I can send you the graph. It was a raving success. The price differences mm. overnight between France and the Netherlands, 10 euros per megawatt hour difference. The price difference went to zero overnight. Not by building new power lines, not by creating new exchanges, not by the consolidation of the exchanges, mm. but just creating a smarter system. It was wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. I remember, I remember those days very clearly, but uh, even though it's fading a bit. But uh, if we can stick with the, the cross-border side of things, policymakers have made a, the 70% target that TSO should make available 70% of capacity for cross-border trading mandatory. What, what's your view here? Well, I think it is a difficulty because some countries are very well interconnected and some countries are poorly interconnected. For a country like Iberia, for instance, this 70% doesn't mean a lot for the market inside that country. For a country like Belgium and the Netherlands, who have a large percentage of interconnection compared to their national volume, it's different. So I've not been following that lately, but I think this should be implemented with some understanding that those countries have different positions. In fact, the smaller the country, the more the impact of the rule, because then you have less national volume and you have more interconnector volume on the average. Absolutely. Um, I think we should move on and talk a little bit about what, uh, or talk a lot about what you're doing now, Bert. Can you tell us a little bit about your current position and what you're, what you're working on? After I left um, APX Index, I was asked by a very, uh, very well-established and long-lived um, consultancy, Beroschot Consultancy, 
to build up an energy team and really an energy transition team going for the energy transition. And at the moment, over 25 people are working on the energy, tra energy transition at Beresford Consultancy. So it's been really a very good experience. And we've been done many things on scenarios, like I mentioned, mm -hmm. making scenarios that give uh, food for thought of how to make an energy transition in an economical way. We did uh, lots of other things on electrification, on flexibility, really in electricity, because there my market background is useful, of course. We did a very lot on hydrogen because that was, uh, that was key and we were one of the first who started with it. You mentioned the 2050 goals, but if we can skip to the 2030 goals now being discussed uh, in Brussels, yeah. we moved to 60%, potentially... 55, but mainly 60% cut in yeah. reduction by emissions by, by 2030. What does that mean for wholesale electricity and gas markets? Are we talking 2030 now? 2030, yeah. Well, it means 2030, by all means, is still in character. It is a lot of additional renewables in an otherwise still fossil fuel driven system. So the basic parameters of the system do not change because the security of supply backbone is still there in 2030. You, see, you will see some effects of the electrification kicking in. And sometimes there will be a danger for shortages because of electrical heat pumps entering the scene and creating more demand in cold winter periods. That is often underestimated. You will see, of course, overproduction of renewables. And you see that already, and it will continue to build up. But by and large, so you see more volatility in the system, short term and long term. Absolutely. You mentioned hydrogen, but we've talked about your massive experience in exchanges, uh, energy exchanges. And I know there are some plans for a hydrogen exchange. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, this is really an interesting thing because I've been asked after an initial study, pre-feasibility study, which was commissioned by the Dutch government to myself. And we offered that to the Dutch Minister of Economic Affairs and Climate a month ago, and it was also sent to Parliament. And at the end of that um, project, we really thought we should make a next step. This is an important opportunity we have in the Netherlands and uh, beyond. Because we have important harbors, we have an important gas infrastructure that can be partly converted to hydrogen. We have very good connections to other countries and we have lots of plans, especially in the, in the harbor and industrial regions. So then Gazuni and four Dutch harbors went, came together with me and said, let's make a next step and do what we call a definition study about a hydrogen exchange, which is about how can it be built up. And it's really different, Richard, from anything else I have done before. Because you could say, ah, Bertenauden have founded an electricity exchanges and gas exchanges in different countries, acquire them and, and be, be acquired and so on, he's been there. But in one fundamental way, of course, this market is still different. It's very different. The Dutch minister said it to me. He said to me, you have the audacity to launch um, a plan for an exchange between a demand which is yet to come <laughs> and a supply which is yet to be established. <laughs> That is largely, eh? at least in the liberalization, physically, the demand and the supply was there. Mm. It just needed to be liberalized. That was an important step from a regulatory viewpoint, but physically, it was all there. The power plants were there. The, the gas supply was there. Everything was there. Also, the grid was there and the pipeline were there. We have the audacity that we can think we can build up an exchange or trading facility parallel to the market which is it is supposed to service. And that is um, a challenge, but um, a challenge um, I'm ready to take and very eagerly, I would say. Absolutely. So, you know, in terms of setting on an exchange when the commodity doesn't even exist yet, I mean, that's quite a constant move, but can you tell us a little bit about 
you know, the status and maybe some of the plans? When do you hope to have it up and running? Uh, these kind of things. Well, it was uh, stated um, in the report called a hydrogen exchange for the climate, which was uh, submitted um, to the parliament. Really, at the latest, we know when it would be ready. And that would be when the what we call the hydrogen backbone, which is contemplated, is realized. And that is a hydrogen backbone. And the plans are all there and, and visible for everyone to see where you convert one part of the Dutch gas pipeline system into hydrogen. And here it really is one of the key aces in the Netherlands. Because in many countries, in any given area, you have only one high-pressure transportation line of gas, of natural gas. Here the Netherlands is different. We, we have pipeline streets in which several high-pressure pipelines are running together in parallel. So it is re relatively easy to convert only one of them for hydrogen use and still keep the natural gas intact. So we can build the new system parallel to the old system. Here too, you can have your cake and eat it too. <laughs> Perfect. And when, by when can we have our cake then, uh, Bert, do you think? Yes, you need, uh, Five years, uh, ten years? There's a project there which is called Highway 27. Okay. And that tells it all. But we don't want to wait with the exchange till 27. And that's why we are also involving also the harbors, because they have many plans. We talk about Groningen seaports. We're talking about Amsterdam. We're talking about Rotterdam, of course. We're talking about North Seaport, which is in Zealand. So four of them as co-sponsored of, um, of this project. And each of them, together with the industry in those parts, have far-reaching plans in hydrogen. And they're coming online earlier. And so maybe something earlier can be started up in one of or more or these harbors or between these harbors. We are at the moment trying to find out. But I hope we don't have to wait five years to have that uh, cake and, and eat it. So uh, in the meantime, I look forward to welcoming you back on the pod at another occasion. And uh, best of luck with this project. Thank you very much for joining. Well, thanks for having me, Richard, once more. Listeners, that's about all from the Montel Weekly Podcast this week. You can now follow the podcast on our own Twitter account, the Montel Weekly Podcast. Please direct any suggestions, questions, or potential guests. You can send us an email to podcast at montelnews.com. And lastly, remember to keep up to date with all that's happening in the energy markets on Montel News. You can subscribe on all the regular podcast sites, but please rate and review us if you can. That helps us to improve. Thank you and goodbye.